Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Started preparing for this, thinking that it was Memorial Day tomorrow. So, this theme maybe would go more with Memorial Day. I mean, it's not a big deal. Um, and after I sent Robert the, the information about it, I realized that it wasn't, and I was going to change it. And I thought, you know what, I've already gotten excited about this. I can't go back now. Uh, it wouldn't be as good. So I just stuck with it, and so we'll, we'll go along with it here. Yesterday was American uh, Armed Force Day. Was it? Yes. Okay, then well, this is perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Talking about an army of one, and we're going to go through and look at some individuals, uh, specifically in the Old Testament, that followed through with what God had in mind for them to do and were successful as a result. Before we get there, I want to talk about an individual, and I like going through. There's a website, I think it's um, oh, something.org, uh, uh, Congressional Medal of Honor Society, I think is what it is, um, where they've got an exhaustive list of all of the individuals that have ever received the Congressional Medal of Honor. And you can search through there by name or by uh, by, by war, by military branch, whatever it is, uh, right down to the unit, or division rather, that they fought in. And so I'll go through there sometimes if I'm looking for something uh, to, to talk about an individual with, with acts of bravery or something. But I always come back to this one individual. Maybe it's because the description of his actions in battle are very vivid as to what happened. Um, some of them, depending on the, the accommodation, uh, the person writing it maybe was more detailed than others. But this is Audie Murphy from World War II. Lieutenant Murphy, 2nd Lieutenant Murphy, commanded Company B, which was attacked by six tanks and waves of infantry. 2nd Lieutenant Murphy ordered his men to withdraw to a prepared position in the woods. While he remained forward at his command post, and continued to give fire directions to the artillery by telephone. Behind him, to his right, one of our tank destroyers received a direct hit and began to burn. Its crew withdrew to the woods. Second Lieutenant Murphy continued to direct artillery fire, which killed large numbers of the advancing enemy infantry. With the enemy tanks abreast of this position, Second Lieutenant Murphy climbed on the burning tank destroyer, which was in danger of blowing up at any moment and employed its 50 caliber machine gun against the enemy. He was alone and exposed to the German fire from three sides. But his deadly fire killed dozens of Germans and caused their infantry to attack to waver. The enemy tanks, losing infantry support, began to fall back. For an hour, the Germans tried every available weapon to eliminate 2nd Lieutenant Murphy. But he continued to hold his position and wipe out a squadron, which was trying to creep up unnoticed on his right flank. Germans reached as close as 10 yards, only to be mowed down by his fire. He received a leg wound, but ignored it and continued the single-handed fight until his ammunition was exhausted. He then made his way back to his company, refused medical attention, and organized the company in a counterattack, which forced the Germans to withdraw. His directing of artillery fire wiped out many of the enemy. He killed or wounded about 50. Second Lieutenant Murphy and Murphy's indomitable courage and his refusal to give an inch of ground saved his company from possible encirclement and destruction and enabled it to hold the woods which had been the enemy's objective. This scene here uh, that, that Audie Murphy was faced with was not required of him. I mean, he, nobody would have blamed him for falling back. And yet he stayed forward to protect his, his troops. He could have even ordered someone else to stay up there and fight. But he himself, and it's really kind of a, a, an unbelievable scenario that he found himself in. How was it that he was able to do this for so long, almost completely encircled? Sometimes, though, we find ourselves in difficult situations. And yet, despite the odds, despite every instinct that we have to maybe stop doing what it is we're doing and fall back, we manage to stay the course and do what is necessary. When we look at an example like this, and, 
And like I said, you go on their website and see all these individuals that have won this medal. And all of them, all of them, when you read the description, are deserving of that and so much more honor for their acts of bravery and courage. As we look at some of these examples, and, and I, like, I like studying about World War II. We're getting ready to get into the Civil War in class. And while I, all the kids like studying about war, I don't really so much enjoy studying about the Civil War because it's kind of a depressing war. But World War II is one of those where the good guys are clearly the good guys. And the bad guys are clearly the bad guys. It wasn't over some border dispute. It wasn't even really over uh, a religious difference. It was evil people doing evil. And people uh, that are on the right side are trying to stop that. The Nazis were doing bad things. And the Allies were trying to stop them. And so to see this scene of Audie Murphy standing there in the face of the enemy and deciding to stand there and fight rather than flee is worthy of honor. This, is, this medal that is awarded is the highest medal that uh, a military personnel could be awarded. As we look back through the Old Testament, though, we're going to start in 1 Chronicles. We jump around a little bit. We look at 1 Chronicles, and this is one of those books that a lot of times we just skip over. We've got a lot of names that you can't pronounce. <laughs> But in this, we find some gems that, that really paint a vivid picture of what valor is. Of an individual standing up to the enemies of God and not giving an inch. We start out here in chapter 11, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 11. And this, this phrase, in my mind, just sets my imagination running. It's this elite group of men known as the mighty men of David. The number of the mighty men whom David had. Jeshobim, the son of Hakamite, the chief of the captains. He had lifted up his spear against 300 killed by him at one time. Now there's not a whole lot of details given there other than that at one point in time. This guy stood there and killed 300 men, most likely Philistines, men that were wicked men, not just the enemies of Israel because Israel had come into their land, but enemies of God because they practiced wickedness. I mean, the one thing that springs to my mind is, is offering up their children in sacrifice to their God. 300 men after him was... Eliezer, the son of Dodo, or Dudu, I don't know which one you prefer there. Equally poor choices of names in the English language anyway. He was an Amorite who was one of the 300, or three mighty men specifically here mentioned. He was with David at Pasdam. Now there, uh, now there were the Philistines were gathered for battle. And there was a piece of ground full of barley. So the people fled from the Philistines. But they stationed themselves in the middle of that field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. I want to stop there specifically here as it was these three mighty men of David there in this one patch of ground, this barley field. And it wasn't, it wasn't so much that it was their, uh, their acts of, of bravery, their skill in battle that brought about this great victory. It was the Lord that brought about the victory. It was God's victory that, that happened here. They were simply the instruments. Now, now in verse 15, three of the 30 chief men went, uh, went down to the rock to David, to the cave, cave of Olam. And the army of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Repham. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was at Bethlehem. Bethlehem, excuse me. And David said with a longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem. That was by the gate, and they took it and brought it back to David. Nevertheless, David would not drink it, but poured it out on the ground. And 
And this is one of those where it's almost like this foolhardy mission that they wanted to go and do something for their captain, their commander David. And so they went and they snuck through the enemy just to get him a drink of water. And then David is like, what are you doing? You wouldn't, they'd risk their lives for this water, for you. Why would you just pour it out on the ground? And David said, I'm not going to drink something that you risked your life for. Skipping down to verse 22. I like this scene here. There's a lot of detail here that is just sort of almost thrown in there. I mean, this is like a who's who of valor and courage in the face of the enemy. We see here this guy, ben was the son of Jehovah, the son of a valiant man from Kedbez, who had done many deeds. And this is just some of them. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. That's a bad dude. And he killed an Egyptian, a man of great height, five cubits tall, so seven, eight feet tall, depending on how long your arm is in a cubit. The giant kills this guy with his own spear. He took this giant spear and killed him with it. Now we've got these, these, this collection of the mighty men of David as we see them facing off against the Philistines. But let's go now to Judges. I really enjoy studying the book of Judges. We've looked at a couple of them. We've looked at Gideon and we've looked at Samson. We've talked about Samuel before. And these mighty deeds that they did, they rose up and were successful because of God. Time and time again we see Israel committing sin against God. And God having to go in and rescue them. There's some, some really vivid images here. As you read through this, this book of Judges. When we see Israel having to be rescued. And how God raises up an individual to go and conquer the enemy. We've got Otniel. One of the first ones mentioned here. The evil, they did evil in the sight of the Lord in verse 7 of chapter 3. Anger of the Lord was kindled, so he raised up the enemy to capture them. Israel cried out in verse 9, so God raised up Othniel. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered Cushram, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And he... His power prevailed against him. Then go over to verse 12 where it talks about Ehud. I remember learning about Ehud when I was a kid. And it's one of those classic stories of the bad guy isn't just a bad guy, but he looks like a bad guy. And he has a bad guy name. When you hear the, the name King Eglon, that doesn't sound like a good guy. And he's described in the Bible as being extremely fat. And those are little details that I like. Paints a really vivid picture in your mind. And it says that Ehud, this, this nobody, was a left-handed man. Now, I could be left-handed for a couple of different reasons. I'm left-handed. But I don't have any other kind of visible, physical deformities that would prevent me from using my right hand. It's all just brain work. But it could have been that, that Ehud was left-handed because he had some sort of uh, physical deformality that prevented him from using his right hand. That maybe his hand was withered. Regardless of why he was left-handed, he, he was. And he, had, he made this, this big dagger that was the, a cubit long, which a cubit is from the tips of your fingers to your elbow, your forearm. It's a big knife that he made Double-edged. Why did he make his own knife? Well, because the enemies had taken all the, the weapons from the Israelites. And so the Israelites would have to go and give a tribute to King Eglon. Ehud arranges it to where he is one of those who is going to bring the tribute. And he makes this big dagger. In fact, and straps it to his right leg. And conceals it. And he goes in with the tribute and he <laughs> delivers a tribute to King Eglon. And after they deliver it, he sort of whispers to King Eglon, Hey, I've got a secret to tell you. 
Well, this intrigues King Eglon. And he says, hold on. And he sends everybody out. And they go up to this upper chamber in the cool, cool upper chamber and, and they close the door. And the King Eglon tells Ehud, right, come close so you can tell me. Well, that's when he reveals that he's got this foot-long dagger, stabs this fat king in the gut. And he's so fat, the Bible says, that the fat sucked in the knife so that Ehud couldn't draw it back out and killed him there. And Ehud escapes. And he was able to escape because, again, these are some of those details. Where um, imagine the, the audacity, the nerve that it took of Ehud to go in and do this. He goes into the inner chamber. Everybody knows that he's there. And pulls off this assassination. And then is able to escape. Because his attendants thought that he was in there attending to his natural needs, it says. In his upper cool room. You can make what that what you will of that, but they were thinking that he was in there doing some private business. And so they didn't disturb him. That allowed Ehud to escape. And he goes up to the mountains and he blows the trumpet and he rallies the troops and they go down and they capture the ford there to keep the Moabites from coming over. And they kill, I believe it said 10,000 men. I didn't write that down, but I think that's what it says. All because of this one man was willing to do what God called him to do. Despite the odds against him, he went in and he captured and killed the enemy king and escaped and was able to rally troops in defense of God's people. Go down to chapter 3, verse 31, where you see Shamgar, one verse dedicated to this guy. After him was Shamgar, the son of Atha, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. I mentioned this guy for, for one reason. We don't know if it was at one time that he killed 600 or if it was, if it was over a period of time. Maybe he, he snuck around and did this. But an ox goat is it's an eight-foot pole, sturdy, heavy pole. At one end, it was sharpened metal point that was used to sort of poke the ox along. And the other end had kind of a shovel spade thing on there to, to knock the dirt off the plow. Not a very useful weapon. Again, the same reason he's using an ox goad rather than a sword or a real spear made for battle was because Israel didn't have any weapons. And yet he used what he had in order to defeat the enemies of the Lord. And then he's mentioned here for this one act as being a judge of Israel for his valor. The next ones mentioned, uh, Deborah and Barak. We're not going to talk about them, but rather we're going to talk about this woman who was there and had this tent when, the, uh, when, when Barak had rallied the troops and they go out and they rout the enemy and the, the general of the enemy is on the run. And he comes to this woman's tent and she hides him and he feels safe. She gives him a drink of water. This is in chapter 4, verse 18 and following. And he says, hey, if anybody comes, tell them that I'm not here. So she gives him some milk and tucks him into bed and he goes to sleep. And then she takes a tent peg and a hammer to him. What is in your hand? What is it that you have? Well, we see, we see David with a slingshot and some stones. That's kind of the first time we meet David. Becomes one of the most, if not the most famous and popular kings of Israel. David, king of Israel, where Jesus Christ comes from that line. We've got these judges that are immortalized, not just in this one book, but throughout the Bible. We read about some of them by name in Hebrews at the beginning of the, the worship service today. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning of verse 12. We're not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 
And we're not called upon to fight physical enemies. Some are. Some, that's a responsibility they have. Where they go to foreign lands and fight bad guys. As Christians, though, we're not like the Israelites. We're not like those of old where, where the, the enemies of God were physical people in front of them. Where it was people that were doing wicked things and had been doing wicked things for centuries. And God sends His righteous people, His chosen people, Israel, in to punish them. We don't have a physical enemy in front of us. Oftentimes, the, the enemies of the Lord could be physical. A boss asking us to do something that we know to be wrong. Friends inviting us along to participate in evil things. But sin, wickedness, is spiritual. It's a spiritual battle that we're fighting. And as we, we look at what those people that have come before us, those mighty men and women of valor, of courage, who stood up in the face of the enemies and said, no, we will not allow you to continue. We can take courage and strength from their example of faith and valor. What's in your hand? Jamgar used an ox goad. He used what he had where he was. He didn't complain about not having a, a, a weapon or physical training and how to use the weapons. He didn't have a shield or, or armor. He didn't have an army behind him. We look at Ehud, who very well could have been handicapped in some physical way. But he was able to do what he could with what he had where he was. And was able to rally the armies of the Lord and bring about success. We have a staff like Moses who went into Egypt, marched in, and rescued God's people, performing all kinds of miracles through God. Maybe we've got a net like those fishermen that Jesus called. And instead of catching fish, Jesus taught them how to be catchers of men. Or maybe Stephen, like in the book of Acts, as he stood up and preached the truth to those hard-hearted uh, Pharisees, who didn't want to hear the truth. And as a result of them preaching that truth, they got angry, they gnashed their teeth at him, they brought him out and they started stoning him. All the while, Saul watched on. Saul later repented and became Saul, Paul, though, who preached and taught and gave us most of the New Testament. Wonder. We're not told. But I wonder, though, if that message that Stephen preached that one day when he was stoned stuck with Paul for the rest of his life. We never know the influence that we might have. We never know what our actions might lead to in the name of the Lord. As Paul was on that road and he was blinded and repented of his sins, he later became the greatest preacher in the New Testament. What do we have in our hand? What is it that we can use to further the kingdom of the Lord? 2 Timothy 4, 6-8. Paul says, and this is one of the last letters that he ever wrote. He was in prison at the time. Political prisoner. A prisoner because he was a Christian. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Men like Audie Murphy, we give medals to. And honor them in the news and, and, and media, the president will will award him this. Congress will vote on it. It's a big ceremony. A great honor. Many have received this Congressional Medal of Honor after they've died in battle. It's awarded for those who go above and beyond the call of duty. Do not what's just required of them because they're military and they're supposed to do certain things, but because they go above and beyond. We're not going to receive one of those medals. 
we'll receive a medal that's not going to be tarnished. It's not a medal that's going to have to be reminded about on the internet. It's going to be one that's going to be lasting forever. An everlasting crown of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 and following. I read that earlier. I won't take the time to read back through it again. That is by far my favorite passage of Scripture to read. You can't hardly read this and not feel some sort of welling pride for these men and women who are mentioned there. This sense of, of honor and duty that they had and of unwavering faith for God. That they stood up to the evil one and did what was right. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews. Therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. And this, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of of the throne of God. It's those men and women that, that he mentions there in Hebrews chapter 11, not just the last part, but the whole book there, the whole chapter of talking about all these people who, who followed through and were faithful to God and God was faithful to them. Since we're surrounded by those individuals and because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, we should lay aside everything that could prevent us from being just as faithful in our spiritual battle as those were in the physical. Being a Christian, we're not necessarily called to fight a physical battle. We're not necessarily called to give up our physical life. However, we are called to be faithful to God and He will be faithful to us. If you would like to be a part of that group of individuals that will receive that crown of life, that award that won't fade away, you can repent and have your sins washed in baptism. But many of you are Christians here this morning. Fight the good fight. Keep the faith. Finish the race. Live that life of faithfulness to God because one day we will have that crown of righteousness. The gospel is always open to you. Won't you come?